The next chapter in the history of the airline industry, and specifically American Airlines, came uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and what was happening was that um, as deregulation happened, um, uh, a lot of airlines came in, price wars became very common, became much cheaper to fly. So the number of people who were flying rose dramatically. Um, and uh, uh, American Airlines started to experiment using data-driven ways of, of pricing. What American Airlines did was to hire a bunch of smart uh, people, mostly from MIT, spend $50 million and develop a system called Dynamo, um, D-I-N-A-M-O. Um, and what the system did was essentially to determine what the price should be almost for every single ticket that American Airlines sold. And at this point, they had something like close to 800 um, airplanes and three and a half thousand flights a day. And uh, so um, they were basically the world's biggest airline. Um, and uh, um, they uh, became pioneers in something called yield management. And what yield management is, is to um, price something so that you get as much value out of your investment as possible. Now, yield management is a very specialized topic. Uh, it's almost a science. So I'm just going to give some examples of the more basic techniques um, that are being used in this. But this is something to bear in mind the next time you're out flying. Um, well, I'm making this video during the COVID-19 crisis, so that, that might be some time. Um, but, you know, during um, in regular times, um, these are some of the techniques that, that airlines use, and some of them are quite familiar to you. Perhaps some others are quite new. Um, but there, there are a number of, of things that airlines can do. Um, one of the most uh, common ones um, is overbooking. And overbooking essentially means selling more tickets than you have seats. Um, and um, Airlines vary in how much they do this. Um, if you are a traditional airline, a network airline, such as Lufthansa, British Airways, American Airlines, United Airlines, um, um, KLM, Air France, um, you will tend to overbook quite a bit more um, than the low-cost airlines like Ryanair or Wizz Air or Norwegian, um, they, they, they um, overbook not so much or not at all. There are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the really low-cost airlines tend to um, have pricing policies where the customer pays and if you don't show up, you still have to pay for the ticket. Whereas business, businessmen's airlines like SAS and, and, and British Airways have quite a few passengers that fly on full price tickets. And um, um, if they don't show up, they get their money back. So, um, you know, uh, statistically, you know that some people are not going to show up and therefore you overbook. And how much you overbook varies. Um, if it is a very busy um, uh, route, mostly with business people, uh, you can overbook as much as 5% to 6%. Uh, percent. Uh, a more common figure is perhaps 3% more, and, and some airlines are much lower than that, and some um, do it not at all. And if you've been overbooked, you know, of course, what happens. You will be offered some money to take a later flight, and very often... Um, the people who do that are either people who you know um, have time and want some money, students, people who are poor. Um, the reason is that um, it it you know it 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 the cost of paying those people um, to take a later flight is much lower than what you make by filling the flight up as much as possible. There are various numbers bandied about. I have heard from British Airways in the early two thousands that their annual spend um, was eight million uh, pounds on uh, people who were overbooked. And that also calculated the negative publicity they got from overbooking. 
but they also calculated that they made uh, 50 million pounds uh, more per year because they could fill the airplanes fuller via overbooking. So, and most of the time overbooking is not a problem for the person being overbooked uh, if it's handled uh, smoothly. So that's one way of doing it. Another one, of course, is to have different uh, service levels. And, you know, we know that you have, you know, first class, uh, you have business class, you have a coach, as it's called in the United States. Um, sometimes people call it monkey class um, and various versions of that premier business and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there are various variants of this. What's typical, or at least traditionally what's been typical, is that the business class price is two to three times as expensive as the coach and that the, the first class is twice as expensive as uh, business class. Um, so, you know, and uh, the service levels, of course, are different. Uh, in business class, you get, you know, bigger seats, uh, coffee, um, you get a better meal, you get maybe some wine, something like that, you get more frequent flyer points, you get access to the lounge, um, things like that. For first class, the service levels are even higher, and some um, airlines, particularly the Arab ones, have extremely high service levels. But overall, um, there has been a gradual phasing out of the very high service level, first class, and a tendency, it turns out that business people value flexibility more than anything else. They value um, not so much, you know, getting a free uh, drink um, as much as they value being able to board first, being first in line if the plane is canceled and they need to rebook their ticket, um, skipping ahead in, turn, in security and in all other lines um, um, and also flexibility in rebooking the ticket. So, so those things, the flexibility has long term turned out to be more important for business people um, than the cheap ones. The reason is actually quite smart because um, you know, it, it, it used to be normal in the airline industry that the business class would cover the cost of the airplane and you would make money on, on, on the, the leisure travelers. But having this price discrimination means that you can lower the prices more than you otherwise would have to do if they were all the same price. And then you can raise the prices a bit on business and you get more money out of the whole plane. So that, that's, that's basically how it works. There are variants of this. Uh, you can try to identify who is coach and who is business. It's quite common, for instance, um, to price based on time. So their prices will be different at different times of the week. For a long time, it was very common that, you know, it was a lower price if you were away from home on a Saturday. So if you flew out before a Saturday, and if you wanted to fly back before the Saturday, uh, the price would be quite high. But if you stayed over Saturday uh, and flew back on Sunday or maybe the week after, it would be much cheaper. And the reason has nothing to do with cost. One thing you have to be aware of when it comes to pricing in airlines is that cost is not important at all. What you have to look at is can I price it so that I get as much money out of the airplane as possible? And um, if you price it this way so that it's cheaper if you're away on Saturday, um, that is a very uh, good way to separate the business traveler from uh, the leisure traveler. And we say, we say about business people that they are time poor and cash rich and for leisure travelers that they are time rich and cash poor. So if you can stay away um, Saturday, you know, if you are traveling for leisure, that's what you want to do anyway. If you're a business person, you want to get back home to your family on Saturday. And it's a fairly effective way of separating the two just by having that pricing scheme. There are other ways you can do uh, pricing. Um, you can price based on where people are coming from. So, for instance, um, um, I once spoke, I, I got some um, data from, from British Airways many, many years ago, and they talked about their flight from London to Amsterdam. 
and that flight is very short um, it's not very far I think it takes maybe something like 40 to 50 minutes um, and uh, they had 42 different prices based on where you were coming from the most expensive price was if you showed up in London just before the plane was leaving put your credit card down and bought a, f a business class ticket and you might pay as much as 350 pounds for a very very short flight um, but for a number of other flights um, they would actually just give you the flight for free and for example if we try to draw a map here I'm not very good at doing this but imagine this is this is the UK this is Europe and over here we have Japan and then of course we have Asia and everything else in between and here is Amsterdam uh, and here is London um, and here is uh, Tokyo now um, if you came in on British Airways from Tokyo and flew into London and you wanted to fly on to Amsterdam they would basically give you that ticket for free um, or even you know some airlines would even sell you a flight Tokyo London to Amsterdam cheaper than a direct flight from Tokyo um, to Amsterdam and the reason is British Airways does not dominate Amsterdam KLM uh, Air France does and KLM Air France have many direct lines um, if um, London if, if, if British Airways can give away the ticket to Amsterdam they can attract more people uh, flying from Tokyo to London and then on to Amsterdam and it is the long flights that the big airlines tend to make their money on they want to fill up the big planes so it can make sense to give away the ticket so as you see uh, overbooking having different service level different classes if you will having lower prices certain time you know certain mechanisms um, and um, this is actually called fair classes um, this pricing based on, on on where in the network you come from all these are techniques that that airlines use <coughs> the more advanced airlines will use a technique called bucketization and it works like this um, you take um, an airplane here's an airplane um, seen from the side and you divide it into something that's called buckets now one bucket uh, so here's the pilot in front here um, and then you have a uh, first class and first class is kind of a separate thing in the United States it's called first class and coach um, in uh, in Europe is uh, it tends to be business class and 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 and, and economy uh, their names differ around the world sometimes you have first and business and, and 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 coach and various other various but let's say you have first class and that's kind of its own business you don't think so much about it and then you take all the rest uh, let's say maybe you have 180 seats here and you divide that into let's say nine or something like that buckets and here is bucket uh, number one and let's say it contains uh, 16 seats and you put that out for sale in the reservation system and you price it at maybe let's say 169 dollars um, for this particular flight and you put that out six months in advance so normally when you buy a ticket on an airline if you buy it a year in advance you will just get a fixed price and that fixed price operates until it's six months left then they start this process so okay say so 16 seats 169 dollars and they estimate that this is going to sell out in maybe 18 days okay right um, and then they start selling and people book seats and so on and so forth and it turns out that this doesn't sell out in 18 days it actually sells out in 16 days two days before they estimated uh, and they have excellent data based on many years of flying well that is a signal that says hey wait a second um, maybe there's more demand here than we thought okay as soon as they sold out this bucket then the next bucket goes online and let's say that's 16 seats as well and uh, they also estimate that that is going to sell out in 18 days 
But instead of pricing it at 169, well, I see, okay, wait a second here. There seems to be more demand. We're actually going to raise the price to 179 instead. Okay. And you continue doing this um, uh, until the whole airplane is sold. And you attempt to get as high a price for every single seat as possible. It's actually very difficult to do that because if you look at an airline seat, um, you know, in, in every cost picture, if this is 100%, um, you have a certain percentage that is fixed cost and a certain percentage that is variable. And for an airline, and this depends whether you count per route, per flight or per seat. But if it's for a seat, um, the variable cost is very small, maybe 5% maybe less than that. Because if you fly an airplane, um, even if the airplane is empty, it costs almost as much to fly. If the number of passengers goes below a certain